So you probably saw when you came in some funky looking kind of robotic things, not, not me, <laughs> um, but the things by the door. Um, and they are here today because of Professor Salah Sukarai, um, who is a professor of robotics and intelligent systems at Australia Center for Field Robotics. And so he's going to now speak for 10 minutes. He's uh, led a number of robots and intelligent systems projects. Um, and he's done consultancy for Qantas BAE Systems, um, QLD Biosecurity in the New South Wales government. So he will be talking about field robotics transforming Australian agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour to be standing before you today. We've heard a little bit about transport and I'll talk a little bit about robotics and transport. Um, and we also talked a little bit about energy and water, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well in terms of the robotics context. And the panel next is on agriculture, and I'll talk a little bit about robotics and agriculture as well, so that's good. Um, I guess what I'd like to ask is whether systems become more sustainable when humans are out of the loop, or are we hopeless at controlling machines, whether they're buses or cars or trains or anything like that. So that's probably as controversial as I'll get, I hope, uh, through, this, uh, through this talk. What I'd like to do over the next few minutes is talk to you about the significant and transformational impact that field robotics is having in the Australian industry. And in keeping with the theme of the forum, how robotics is actually helping in sustainability. And I'm going to, for the purposes of this talk, because a lot of the work we do is with industry, define sustainability as both the economic viability of that operation, coupled with uh, reducing environmental impact in various forms. Now, field robotics is not the same as your normal robotics that you find in, in a car manufacturing plant uh, or that you might find in a warehouse plant or those little vacuum cleaners that you've probably, they're about $200 now that you buy that don't work, uh, that you put into your houses. So field robotics is really about automating large outdoor machinery. Um, so taking an example, you might take a car, a truck, a train, etc remove the cabin from there, replace it with lots of computers on board, lots of sensors, lots of algorithms, and then program it to do autonomous tasks in various forms. And really what you'd like it to do is do those autonomous tasks 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all weather conditions, day in, day out. Uh, what's not known by many is that Australia leads the world when it comes to both the research and development of field robotic systems, as well as the commercial industry government uptake uh, of these systems. And the reason why is because we have such a large land mass, we have a small population, a large primary industry, long haulage routes, um, adverse weather conditions, changes in terrain, people who don't want to work out in the desert or on farms, high wages, international competitors. There's many, many reasons why, what, as they come together, field robotics is used um, in various industries. And I'm just going to go through some examples just so they, you, know, you get a picture of what's happening around the world. So the University of Sydney and Patrick Stevedores, as the first example, have been working on automating a complete container terminal handling facility. If you go 1,000 kilometres north of here, so up at Brisbane, and you go to the port of Brisbane, you'll find that there are 35 straddle carriers moving around fully autonomously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, a straddle carrier is a 60 tonne, 50 metre high machine that moves at about 30 kilometres per hour, so they're quite significant animals when there's no one driving them, they're just moving around autonomously. So there's 35 of these things moving containers all around and all of it's monitored down here in Sydney at the Port, of, uh, Port Botany. So the only people up in Brisbane are the maintenance crew that you have there. And what's been demonstrated over the years has been the increased productivity. The autonomous system itself can actually operate at a higher productivity level than manned operations. So from an economic viability perspective, there's the sustainability tick. But what about the environmental impact? So what we found is as you computerise these vehicles and you add lots and lots of sensors on board and you put smart algorithms on board and so forth, you can actually make them, you can actually make them run at their peak performance, a lot more efficient than a human operator can actually uh, work with them. And what we found, for example, is that you can get 65% fuel efficiency out of an autonomous straddle carrier compared to a manned vehicle. So 65%. So that's quite significant. Furthermore, we don't, these vehicles, they move around and they don't use cameras or anything to know where they're going. They'll use laser and, and, and radar systems. So basically what that means is we can switch off the lights at night and you save a quarter of a million dollars in electricity bills every year. Another saving that you get out of that. So there's quite significant processes and the maintenance is at an all-time low as well. So normally they would change tyres every 
three, so three times a year. Now they change them roughly once a year. Again, the vehicle is driven a lot better and a lot smoother uh, action. So that's just one example. Another example is university in Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto is the largest iron ore um, miner in the world. Um, have been working collectively on what we call the mine of the future. So what will an open pit mine look like uh, in 10 years' time? And the work that we are looking at is how do you automate 400 tonne trucks that are talking to 100 tonne drill rigs that are talking to multiple utility vehicles continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Again, it's doing the same thing in terms of fuel efficiency, low maintenance as you would find in the stevedoring example. But more importantly, because these systems have different types of sensors on board, they can detect where the ore body is very accurately and they'll only dig where the ore body is. So you minimise how much environmental impact you have. You don't, you're not digging up and exploding the ore body and the dirt all over the place and then worrying about processing later on. You can extract the ore body exactly where it is and then minimise the amount of processing later on. Another example is a partnership between the University of Sydney and Qantas Airways to look at revolutionising the way flight planning systems are developed. Um, and this, uh, the, the project that we have with Qantas Airways is actually trying to develop optimised algorithms, so algorithms that actually develop optimised flight plans that will determine the optimal path between points A and point B when you have wind and weather data available to you in, in, in real time. And what we're finding already is that we can actually deliver, opti you, you can develop flight routes that will go in very, very strange shapes. So for example, going from Sydney to LA, you can actually go along over the ocean and then up north, almost around Alaska and back down again if you follow the winds and you can end up landing with less fuel and still on time in that process. But it doesn't feel right from a customer's perspective to fly all the way up that north and come back down again. But again, what we're finding is through that fuel efficiency process. Um, we're also working with Qantas Airways at developing accurate fuel models so we can collect all the data on board after an aircraft has landed, we can process that data, and we can learn accurate fuel burn models for each individual aircraft. And what that basically means, you can go to one type of aircraft, you can tell it where it's going to fly to, and you can accurately load the amount of fuel that you need on board. Any more fuel than that, then you're carrying dead weight, which means you burn more fuel. And we're finding that you can actually achieve improved accuracy in terms of how much fuel you want to uplift between 0.5% and 1%. Now, when you have a $4 billion a year fuel bill, 1% is quite significant in terms of both the economic, but also we're now looking at the greener aviation aspect. Less fuel is burnt and, and the emissions are reduced. So that's a lot to do with uh, the transportation aspect. Coming up next is the panels on agriculture, so I'll talk a little bit about some robotics work that we are doing in the agriculture department. Um, over the last 10 years, the, uh, the University of Sydney, along with Horticulture Australia, has been developing a number of different ground robots that can operate in tree crop farms. So they can actually go up and down tree crop rows, look at the trees, and detect individual fruit autonomously and individual nuts autonomously. So what happens is the vehicle can go up and down, we can measure the soil properties, measure the health of the tree, and at the end of the traversal, the farmer gets an accurate update of what's going on in the farm. And they'll know exactly where the crop yield is, how it's changing over the parts of the farm. They're measuring the conductivity and the soil parameters as well. And so they know where to place water, where to place fertiliser precisely. And so again, looking at the environmental impact and minimising the environmental impact. But also giving unprecedented data to the farmer uh, in various forms. Another project that we have with, uh, with the vegetable industry um, is looking at developing a solar-powered robot which will go through broadacre farms looking at crop health and crop yield as well, but it also has a robotic arm, and that robotic arm can actually detect weeds and, and mechanically remove the weeds from the soil. So what you have now is a solar-powered robot and no herbicide use whatsoever. Again, monitoring what's going on on the farm, providing crop health, crop yield information as well as what's going on in the soil, and minimise the environmental impact that you have. And when you start talking about a solar-powered robot, you're talking about a, a vehicle that's uh, probably 200 to 300 kilometres, uh, sorry, 200 to 300 kilograms, so much lighter than the tractors that they have on board um, on, in the farms, and hence minimising soil compaction as well. So there are many benefits coming out of that. Also, over the last 10 years, we've been developing robotic aircraft, and as Kerry was mentioning before, the, the, the display out there showing you some of those. The robotic aircraft are used a lot with uh, agriculture agencies such as Meat and Livestock Australia and Land and Water Australia and we had projects with them as well as Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria Biosecurity to fly these robotic aircraft over large area and collect centimetre resolution data of the terrain below. And then we take this imagery 
and we pass it to machine learning algorithms that have been trained to detect invasive species. So now we can detect invasive plants that are coming through, as well as animals, so we can track locusts and detect fire ant mounds. And, and this is a, a, a quite a um, significant breakthrough compared to what's happening now. At the moment now they'll do some samples in a few locations, it's a very laborious task, and from that try and predict where they think the invasive species are going. Well, now, for about an hour of flight, you can travel a 20 by 20 kilometre area with these aircraft, collect sub-centimetre resolution, pass it through the algorithms. After about two hours, you get a map with all the geo-reference results, the locations of where all the invasive species are and the animals are as well. So that again is showing you how robotics is used um, in that manner, in supporting agriculture in terms of being sustainable as well. So the range of examples I have given you is just a select few, and there are also examples in defence, education, uh, infrastructure monitoring and health that I can talk about. But what I'm hoping we're seeing is that there's a spread of use of robotics and intelligent systems across many different areas and trying to support industry in terms of keeping that economic viability. But in the process of doing that, we're also minimising the amount of environmental impact that the, system has, the systems have as well. And while the first impression is that robotics brings about a reduction in labour costs, I'm hoping what you've also seen is the, um, the environmental gains that are happening as well. And the reason why is because these systems are such highly computerised. We put, you know, it's cheap now. You can buy $2,000 worth of you know, computing power, which is so powerful that you throw them on board the robot, they can process the data so much better than a human can and act a lot quicker than a human can in these means. And so what that means is that you can actually program the robots to act in a sustainable manner. You can tell it over the next day, as you're doing this task, I want you to be the most fuel efficient uh, I want you to undertake the most fuel efficient behaviour you can while you're doing these tasks, or the most time efficient behaviour. These are things that you can actually mathematically quantify, put into the robot, and the robot is out there and, and does it. And you can actually prove it uh, at the end of the day. But there is a bigger picture that I want to be able to communicate today, and that is that, and, and, and you can see this through the panels uh, in the sessions today uh, that we've seen. Uh, just like your computer can talk to another computer halfway around the world and exchange information and so forth, what we are starting to see now is robots talk to other robots and talk to other robots not just within a system, so not just within a farm, for example, or in a container terminal, but across systems, okay, between systems. And that's, and that's going to be an important breakthrough um, as we go through over the next few years. So you're going to get that agriculture robot that's on the paddock that's finding out information about what's going on in terms of crop yield, talking to the logistics robot that's sitting at the farm gate, talking to the warehouse robot that's over at the, at the supermarket distribution centre. Or, as another example, um, we're seeing less and less air traffic control operators. Actually, a lot of the air traffic control that we're doing now is, is computerised. There's a lot more computerisation going. And you see aircraft now that are also like the 787 and the A380, which have got a significant computing power on board. And what you'll soon find is that air traffic control systems will start talking directly to the aircraft and providing optimal flight routes as they're going through and landing at the airport systems. Again, minimising congestion, but also looking at fuel efficiency. Uh, in the past, air traffic was focused very much on flying at fixed altitudes and that you could only control your heading angle, while now with the significant amount of computing power that we have on board, we can actually determine what we call 4D trajectories. Where should you be in 3D space at what point in time? And we can define those paths so that they become optimally uh, fuel efficient. So to conclude, I'd like to leave you with a thought, and that is that we talk a lot about sustainability and so forth through the, um, through the panel discussions today. And a lot of it's driven from the top, how we want to be more sustainable. And we kind of go down through the various layers of processes and controls until we get to something down the bottom that does an act of some form. And usually that act is controlled by a human in some way. But what I'd like to leave you with is that robotics actually breaks a number of those layers. And the reason why is because the entity on the bottom that's actually doing the act has so much computing power on board that it can process information a lot better and a lot quicker than a human can. And hence, it can be a lot more efficient and effective as well. And so when thinking about the vision, also think about the technology, because I think sometimes the technology will exceed the expectations or the current knowledge that you might have. And that technology may actually transform the vision uh, as you're going through. So as was, as was mentioned, if you go to the foyer outside, you'll see some of the robots. You'll also see some of the movies of, of other robotic systems that we've worked with uh, around the country. And again, I thank you for your time um, and in listening to me today. Thank you.